Hey, what's up guys, and welcome back to Calvin's Garage. Uh, I want to talk about a topic that's been buzzing on my mind uh, for a while now. Why I don't like Teslas. Now, before the Tesla stands start flooding my comments with angry messages, I'm not saying that Tesla is a bad company or that their cars are bad. I actually have a lot of respect for what they've been able to do, the impact they've had on the automotive industry and the world. Um, however, there are some limitations with the brand that I wanted to discuss. Um, there, there's been a lot of concerns and criticisms surrounding Tesla and their cars, and I just wanted to bring up these points. Uh, so whether you're a diehard Tesla fan or a skeptic like me, I hope this video sparks some interesting discussions and debates. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first point I wanted to bring up is the expensive price tag. Um, basically, what, what do you get for your money? Tesla has become like the Gucci handbag of the car world. It is an accessory. It's a symbol of status. But really, you don't... a $2,000 handbag isn't going to be any better quality than a $50 handbag. Um, and a Tesla that costs, you know, a couple hundred thousand isn't going to be any better than, you know, an equivalent uh, gasoline-driven counterpart. Uh, now, of course, this issue has, um, of course, this has been an issue in our society, especially in the tech world. Uh, things like the iPhone prices have gone up drastically, and it's not... Some people have argued uh, that the quality of the iPhone is not synonymous with its price tag currently. Oh boy, I'm going to be pissing off the Tesla fans, and the Apple fans, and the designer handbag fans, I guess. Oh well. Um, but basically, they, they, Tesla does have some impressive torque, and with an electric car, you have all of that torque, all of that horsepower, right on demand. You don't have to wait for it, you don't have to worry about specific power bands and when to shift, you just mash your foot down and go. And also, Tesla has had some impressive safety features, things like the Tesla Cam, uh, dog mode, all sorts of cool features, but I struggle to I struggle to see where they are worth the price tag. Of course, one of the issues with the price tag is their quality control issues. Tesla have actually had a lot of problems with quality control. Not only the fit and finish of their vehicles, things problems with the way the paint is cured makes the the paint weaker and it's not standing up to sunlight. Also, panel gaps not working right. Uh, features just not working. Um, and then don't forget all the uh, videos of Tesla owners driving through puddles and then their car stops working. But no, don't worry, the Tesla is completely waterproof. For example, in 2019, there was a video of a Tesla Model 3 getting stuck in a flooded tunnel in China. While Tesla claims that their vehicles are designed to handle water up to a certain depth, incidents like these suggest there may be issues with their quality control and engineering. Another issue I have with Tesla, and this is true of many car brands now, but Tesla is the first and the biggest defender. It's the over-reliance on touchscreens. Everything in a Tesla is controlled by that giant iPad in the center. Uh, everything from your music to, I don't, I'm, window controls? Are window controls in there? Um, climate controls, seat adjustment, radios, uh, and this touchscreen, first of all, there's no feedback on a touchscreen. Um, if you're in a normal car with analog dials, 
you can feel where you are. You can feel the radio dial. You know right where it is. You can change the radio station. You can roll up the windows. You can adjust your seat all by touch. However, on a touch screen, you have to actually see where you're pointing because if I am trying to touch that spot right there without seeing it, uh, it's going to be more difficult. I'm just going to spin around a bit and then... Um, so, I, if I'm trying to touch that spot without looking at the screen, it's very difficult. I have to actually look back here in order to reliably touch that same spot. I, I can't... I have to at least look at it up the, out of the corner of my eye. And so that can actually cause issues with distracted driving if you're taking your eyes off the road, especially with the giant touchscreen that controls everything. Because everything is controlled through the screen, you have to go through menus and touch things multiple times in order to do anything. And that can create situations where you are staring at the touchscreen for an extended period of time while you're still traveling down the road. Also, if that touchscreen malf malfunctions, you essentially have a very expensive 2,000 pound paperweight. With the um, quality control issues that we discussed in the previous point, is more likely to happen. Um, so another thing is limited access to repairs. So Tesla actively prevents third-party repairs, uh, which can make it difficult for owners to get their cars fixed. Now, this has led to many lawsuits and actually the entire right to repair movement uh, which is in multiple sectors. So it's uh, big in the automotive industry, the tech industry, and also agriculture too, because John Deere, actually, the way they set up their computers, uh, if anybody tries to repair a John Deere tractor, a new one, that's not at a John Deere dealership, they can't, and the tractor will just shut itself down. It'll prick the tractor. Then you have an even more expensive even more heavy paperweight. Um, but seriously though, the right to repair fight is something that I'm very passionate about, of course, as a person who works on their own cars and stuff. But uh, having such a tight grip on the car and not allowing others to repair it really sets up a monopoly where repairs are just super expensive. Another issue with Tesla is their subscription services. Now, a lot of car companies, uh, this was really big in tech. The subscription-based services like Adobe Premiere is subscription-based. You have to pay a set amount each year in order to use it. Um, but this started to bleed over into the car industry as well. It started out with things like satellite radio and OnStar things that you have to pay uh, periodically in order to continue to use. Um, but now, the subscription services, uh, they're starting to be everywhere with the car companies. And um, so Tesla is, is one of the biggest things. They will give you access to like the full self-driving beta or a heated steering wheel, or the fast charging, but you have to pay in order to use that. Now it's not like it's an upfront fee like when you get an add-on or an extra package when, you're, when you buy the car. All of the Teslas, at least all of the Teslas that were made within the years that those features were able to be, are able to be used, all of those Teslas have the hardware necessary to you to utilize those features the fast charging the heated steering wheel the um they they all have all of those features it's just they're locked behind a paywall and you have to pay elon musk in order to use them now people defend the subscription services saying well what about people who intend to only use them for a short time and then uh get rid of them well 
it also hurts your resale value on the car. Like, and also, who would want to use these things for a short period of time? Theoretically, you want to use these things the entire length that you own the car. So why, why are you keep paying for it? And then when you stop paying for it and sell the car, now you have a car that is no longer able to do fast charging, no longer has full self-driving, no longer has the heated steering wheel and whatever other features uh, they are starting to do these subscription services for. And so that kind of hurts your resale value because you now have a car that doesn't have all the features that are wanted. Another issue that we have to talk about is the environmental impact of Teslas. So this is true of all electric vehicles. They have zero tailpipe emissions. And I saw an electric vehicle ad, I forget what it was for, uh, oh, it was the Subaru, the electronic Subaru. Um, but the ad said that it's zero emissions. Subaru's first all electric zero emissions SUV. But then they had an asterisk and it said zero tailpipe emissions. And that is true because the electric car has no tailpipe. However, um, electric vehicles do still have quite an environmental impact. Um, they require energy in order to produce. The, like, gigafactories, I don't even know how much energy they, they use, but you can imagine the bigger the factory, the more energy it's going to use to actually produce those cars. And then you have to ship those cars out to the dealership, and you also have to get the raw materials somehow. And for the lithium, especially for the batteries on these electric cars, you have to mine it. And actually, lithium mining is a super dirty process. It ruins the environment wherever these lithium mines are. Also, you have to think about where the electricity is coming from that you're using to charge these vehicles. If you are in an area where most of the energy is green, either wind or solar, or if you charge your car at home and you have solar panels at home, then yes, that is completely green energy, renewable. However, in, there, in a lot of parts of the country and in the world, people are still burning coal and other fossil fuels in order to get electricity. Um, and then also nuclear power plants, um, but especially the, the coal. So there's, there are still emissions associated with that vehicle. Also with electric cars, they, at least in the experience so far, they don't tend to last as long as comparable internal combustion cars. You have to think about what happens to the car afterwards. These Teslas and a lot of these electric vehicles, and vehicles in general, are becoming more and more disposable. Just like with the iPhones, they're not meant, they're not really meant to be repaired, and they're not really meant to last forever. They're meant to last a set number of years and then uh, be discarded in favor of buying a brand new one. And so that creates a huge environmental impact, especially again with that lithium. This recent study by Yana Mondra et al. looks at the recycling of lithium-ion batteries and compares them to the recycling of traditional sealed lead-acid batteries and founds that although lithium-ion batteries can be recycled, um, it's not super efficient for recycling for reuse in batteries, but it can still be used in other products. However, the uh, vast majority of lithium ion batteries that are out there are not being recycled. And this is due to a variety of factors. Oh boy, I've been saving this one till toward the end, but um, let's go ahead and open that can of worms. The full self-driving feature. Um, First of all, the name full self-driving is a bit of a misnomer. It's definitely been overhyped and over-advertised. Uh, it does not actually, it's not actually full self-driving. It is advanced driver assistance. 
basically, it's the way it's marketed, it's like the cars can drive themselves without human assistance. That is not true. In fact, there's, there have been a lot of incidents of people misusing the autopilot. I remember seeing one video where a guy was actually sleeping uh, while his Tesla was on autopilot. The police tried to pull him over and the guy didn't wake up. Now, of course, the, the Tesla, the, the driver assistance is really good, so the Tesla maintained its lane. It, uh, maintained its lane, maintained its speed, and everything was good. However, when you combine this careless attitude towards using the full self-driving feature when you're not actively pay attention, and combine that with some of the um, problems with the full self-driving that have been exposed, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, so Tesla's had a problem with randomly stopping because it thinks that there's some obstruction in the road and it turns out that it's just a shadow from an overpass. Um, so in June 2021, a Tesla Model Y owner reported that his car suddenly braked and came to a stop on a highway uh, under an, before an overpass because the car's autopilot feature thought there was a thought that there was an obstruction. The obstacle turned out to be the shadow of the overpass. The obstacle, or the car's autopilot system was not able to distinguish between a real obstacle and a shadow. Now, the main reason for that is because Elon Musk, for whatever reason, does not like LiDAR. So the Tesla autopilot system is based entirely on optical recognition. The, all the cameras on the Tesla look around and then like AI and stuff say, oh, that's a car, that's a person, don't want to hit that, don't want to hit that, oh, that's a red light, we want to stop here, uh, things like that. However, when you're looking at, through a camera, a uh, three-dimensional space becomes two-dimensional and sometimes things that are just shadows look like objects, and so the uh, program recognizes, hey, there's this giant object all the way across the road, we gotta stop right now. And so the Tesla, without warning, slams on its brakes, and then can get rear-ended by all the people behind them and cause a massive pileup, because the Tesla thought there was an obstacle, but it turns out it wasn't there. Now, if they were using something like LiDAR or radar, um, that technology is so the idea behind radar is you have radio waves that are bouncing off of a point and then when it hits an object, the waves bounce back. I probably should have gone with a flat object, but um, basically, because actually pointy objects um, and like boxy shapes deflect radar. That's why the F-117 is shaped the way it is, is to deflect radar. But um, anyway, basically the waves go out, they bounce off of an object and they come back and are detected. And based on the math when it comes to the waves, how long it took for them to go out and come back and some various things with that, the object is the radar system is able to determine where the object is. Um, LiDAR works very similar, but it uses it, it tends to use like light in infrared light usually, I believe. Um, but it tends to use light instead of radio waves. So this would be able to tell you that there is no object there, even though the optical recognition says that there is. However, the Teslas don't have this technology, they don't use it. Other car manufacturers use this technology in their lane keep assist and brake assist and other things. The parking assistant thing, they use this technology, but Tesla does not. And that is one of the causes of these incidents. Um, but that's not the only type of incident. In fact, there have been, uh, there was a viral video about a... Uh, some people going out and testing this full self-driving feature and almost hitting cyclists. In fact, it's a very common issue. Tesla's almost hitting cyclists and pedestrians 
Um, and then also, unable to detect stopped emergency vehicles. A Tesla Model S slammed, in, in 2018, a Tesla Model S slammed into a fire truck parked on the side of the road in California. The driver claimed the car's autopilot system was engaged at the time of the crash, but did not detect the parked fire truck. No one was injured in the crash, but it highlighted the risks of relying too heavily on autonomous driving vehicles. This is not the only incident. Uh, there was actually an incident a few weeks ago where uh, Tesla slammed into a uh, ambulance or something on the side of the highway with its lights on, and it just slammed into it. Did not see it at all. Again, uh, if your Tesla is on autopilot and it crashes or it causes a crash either by stopping in the middle of the highway or not stopping or running over a cyclist, who is to blame? Well, the current, the way, the way it works currently is that ultimately you as the driver are responsible for the control of your vehicle. Even if you are using uh, things provided by the manufacturer like lane keep assist or brake assist or other technologies, uh, assuming those technologies fail, you are responsible for safely operating your vehicle. Now, it does get into kind of a gray area if it's a manufacturer defect and the technology is not working the way it's supposed to and that causes the crash, but in general, you are responsible for safe driving. That's why they say that you should always keep your hands on the wheel and always pay attention when, the, when using autopilot. So another uh, point is the toxic fan base. Tesla has a large and vocal fan base, which sometimes can be off-putting to those who are critical of the company. Some fans are overly aggressive in defending Tesla and its CEO, Elon Musk, which make it difficult to have con a constructive conversation about the company's strengths and weaknesses. And then the very last point that I wanted to discuss today because I uh, grew up in Vermont, we have a lot of cold weather, a lot of snow, uh, Teslas, and this is true for all electric vehicles regardless of the brand, have many limitations when it comes to cold weather and snow. Uh, the first limitation is that the batteries aren't as efficient in the cold weather and so you lose a lot of range. Now they are starting to develop these technologies to like preheat and precondition the batteries. For example, a Tesla Model S in cold weather has been shown to lose up to 40% of its range compared to driving in mild weather. This means the drivers have to plan their trips more carefully uh, to be able to get there and know where the chargers are. Um, but it's further complicated by the fact that the defroster and the heat and all those things that are normally, normally use the heat of the internal combustion engine, they are now relying solely on the electricity from the battery. And so running your heater, running your window defroster, uh, running your heated seats, whatever, that all will, that all confounds on top of the cold weather to reduce your driving range. Um, now there have been a lot of improvements there. Some companies are working on technologies to basically like preheat or precondition a battery before a drive in cold weather. So you uh, essentially start the cold weather prep about 30 minutes before you're supposed to drive somewhere and that kind of conditions the battery and makes it as efficient as possible so that it can have the largest range possible. But again, that still requires extra planning and preparation. And lastly, some electric cars, including Tesla, have been criticized for their handling in snow and ice. Now, this can be more challenging due to the weight distribution in Teslas being, uh, in electric cars being different than internal combustion engine cars, um, also the traction control systems. Basically, because you have all that torque and all that horsepower 
on demand whenever you need it. You don't have to worry about the power band. That also means that it's much easier for the tires to break traction when you are in snow or ice. And so that means it's much easier to lose control of the vehicle. So while a lot of these companies have made improvements to their traction control system and make, making their car easier to drive in the winter, it is still a major concern for uh, potential buyers who live in states with snow. So those are just a few of the reasons I don't like Tesla. Of course, there's always going to be people who disagree with me, and that's okay. Ultimately, it comes down to personal preference and what you're looking for in a car. But for me, these issues outweigh the benefits of owning a Tesla. Thank you for watching, and be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments below.